and for the next 20 minutes or so, um, we've got the following. A, a new feature, uh, a quick roundup of comments and posts um, from my social media. Then we've got this month's chat, which is all about writing about ancient times. And I'll be talking to you just a little bit about a couple of books that are my favorites and a couple of films, one of which isn't my favorite, but you might find quite amusing. And finally, uh, but not least, I will be tackling your questions. We've got some fantastic questions and I've brought quite a, long, quite a lot of props um, this time around. So if I duck out of sight, that's because they're all laid out on the spare room bed. So I'll just be reaching out. So bear with me too, because they're quite interesting. But before we begin, um, just a couple of housekeeping points. Remember, I don't have email. Um, some of you may know that so uh, because I need to have time to write my books. So if you want to ask a question or make a comment and you want to be sure that I will see it, um, please go to my website, michellepaver.com slash ask, uh, because I only have sort of limited time to respond to tweets um, or posts on Facebook and YouTube, that sort of thing. So if you want to be sure I'll answer you, as I say, use the form on my website, michellepaver.com slash ask. Um, it may take a few weeks before I answer um, because we sort of tend to collect them all up and then, but I will answer on the next um, Michelle Paver Live. So please be patient. Uh, finally, just before we begin, a quick reminder, uh, if you want to win a GoPro, try the competition to celebrate uh, the Thin Air paperback by remixing our prank video, uh, six million hits and counting. Um, details again on my website, Michelle Paver. Dot com. So first, here we go, the new feature, the social media roundup. A um, little bit of shuffling of paper on my end here, <laughs> but uh, here we go. As you know, um, I, I do have a bit of a presence here on Facebook as well as Twitter and YouTube. Um, and a few days ago, I started to tweet and post about um, a guest, a new guest in my house. I don't have many. He didn't have a name when he arrived. He just came. But pretty soon he did. Sorry about that, arachnophobes. Um, anyway, that's not me handling him. That's just a picture of a spider. Um, he took up residence and he was large and hairy. He still is. And he lives in my stair, under my stair carpet. So I called him Alaric. Yes, here we go. Fear of public speaking and arachnophobia is pretty high up on the list. I, I agree about public speaking, actually. Um, yes, I don't really like that either, but I have to do it um, because I'm an author. But we had some wonderful uh, comments from people. Um, I'm sorry, yes, some of you really didn't like spiders, um, but I loved Sandra's comment. Um, she didn't actually write anything. <laughs> But she let us know her feelings. I think it's for Rohan that I particularly like the idea of killing a spider for Rohan. That's that's just brilliant. I, that really made me laugh. Um, Liz had a very sensible suggestion uh, that I should give the spider a name. Um, she's given hers. It's called hers. Derek. Um, brilliant. Yes, Gemma and Herb. That's quite drastic. Um, new kit from Orbit. Yeah. OK. Um, and uh, I think as the spider saga unfolded over the next few days, yes, I did sort of mention that I'd, I'd given him a name, how Torak would laugh. Yes, he certainly would. Um, and we had some more. We've got a wood louse called Intrepid. <laughs> uh, spider's name, another spider called Sheldon. Interesting how, how formal these names are. Um, and here's this, this one at the bottom. Um, yes, should I make him pay rent? Well, Rosalind, you ask him. I'm not going to. And Astrid, this is amazing. You've named your son Torak. Um, so that's not spider related at all. Um, but I think that I'm just delighted that you love the book so much. I might just add that uh, when I was in Greenland for the research, um, a Greenlander, an Inuit girl, told me that Torak means perfect in Greenlandic. So that's quite a nice one. Um, so anyway, the saga of Alaric continues. There have been more developments, which I will be tweeting about in due course. Um, and thanks for all your, your tweets and comments. They've been absolutely brilliant. Um, really enjoying them. So that's the social media roundup. Um, now for the sort of chat about a bit of writing and uh, I think I may have said on, on my sort of additional um, thing a few weeks ago that I was going to talk about the natural world. Sorry, I think I got mixed up because we are talking about writing about ancient times this week. 
And for me, that means either the Bronze Age, gods and warriors three and a half thousand years ago, um, and ancient Egypt, or the Stone Age, but of course there are other ancient times. A um, little bit first of all, you can't really get away without doing some research if you want to write about ancient times. Um, Archaeology, uh, you know, find out what people ate, wore, how they lived, um, what they slept in, how they made war, because everybody does. Um, another aspect, though, which I think can get forgotten is how did they think? How do your characters in the ancient world think? Now, how are we going to find out? Well, for ancient Egypt or ancient Greece, that would be the myths and the legends. That'll be really helpful. Um, what about the Stone Age, though? Well, generally with the Stone Age, you've got to go at things a little bit sideways. Um, I think I've, I've talked about this a little bit a couple of weeks ago uh, when somebody wrote in asking you know for books on the stone age and how do we how do we write about the stone age and as i said you need to go a little bit sideways because of course we've got the archaeology we've got the axe heads and the arrowheads and things but they didn't as far as we know leave writing so i tend to do research into how traditional people these days or more recently lived people like the inuit um the sami some of the tribes of the pacific northwest like the haida and the clinket and people like that. Um, so you can, now that's of course not to say that that's really how the Stone Age people lived, but you can take ideas and you can get a feel for how hunter gatherers uh, would have lived. So that's sort of a few guidelines on, on doing your research, but um, here are some, some tips. I think I've got two top tips really. The first one is if, if you find out an interesting piece of research, don't just plonk it into your story. Um, that, that, that That's going to make it boring. I mean, I, I think I use perhaps 1% of my research goes into the stories. Um, most of it gets left out. So, for example, yes, on the screen, you can see Minoan columns at the moment. Well, they look, you know, with sort of broad-shouldered columns, they look like tall men standing guard. You try to work that into the story. Um, that might be what a character would see and how they would feel when they're seeing these, you know, these huge columns. Another example um, from Wolf Brother. I was in a museum once when I was doing the research for Wolf Brother. This was somewhere up in the Arctic, a little museum. And there was a line on a typed piece of paper near a, a, a kayak, which said that for the Aleut, the kayak is the hunting partner. And I loved that. And that gave me the idea for Wren with her bow. The bow for her is a hunting partner, so it's a real friend for her. And so that allowed me to describe the bow, but it actually is a really important part of the story. And then when it's threatened later on in Wolf Brother, we realize, you know, it really means a lot to her. So I think incorporating, using very little research, just the interesting bits, and then incorporating it into the plot, that's my first tip. Um, and my second tip, is it's difficult to describe, but don't patronize the past. Don't think that because things were in the past, they were people were simpler and they didn't know stuff. Okay, they didn't know about antibiotics and things, but they knew how to survive under conditions that we wouldn't know how to survive. We, you know, I wouldn't last five minutes in Lapland in the winter, but Torak would. Um, so I'll show you something that I'll be referring to later on when I answer the questions, but this. This I kept at the front of my working file. This is a picture of, it's from a few hundred years later than Torak's time, but it's a flint dagger. And it's absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I don't, well, I, I mean, look at it. It's so beautifully done. Um, and that I just kept to remind me that, you know, when they make stuff, it works. Um, here's something else. I don't know if you can see. Yes, you can. Good. This is birch bark. This comes from North, well, Arctic Canada, and it's made of folded birch bark and it's got little bits of woven pine root. Um, and this could be a cup or I've got a bigger one um, and which you could use for carrying berries and things. Um, something else, you know, clothes. This is my bugbear. Um, on, on documentaries, they always show Stone Age people wearing rough clothes. Um, but actually, this is a pair of Inuit 
well, this is one of an Inuit mitten made of reindeer hide, just the sort of thing that Torek and Wren would wear. This is made in a traditional way, sewn with sinew. Um, but what I love about it is that the fur on the palm points this way, so that when you're holding a frozen fish or something, when you've just been digging it out of the, or pulling it out of the an ice hole, it does that. It snags on the scales and it doesn't slip out of your fingers. So you know, that's what I mean by not patronising the past. They really knew what they were doing. And just finally, because it's fun, um, this is a pair of Inuit snow goggles, um, just like the ones in Solita. And it took me ages to find these. I finally got some in Alaska last year. And just these little slits cut out the glare. They really, really work, and they're also beautiful. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty cool. That sort of gives you a sense of how I approach writing about the ancient world. Yes, you've got to do a lot of the research, but then you've somehow got to try not to pack it all in, um, because otherwise you'll, you'll clog up your story and make it boring. Just try to make it part of the plot, because then, you know, it's worth it. Um, it's, it's worth reading about because it's, it's part of the plot. It affects how the characters think and and how they feel um and what they do and the second one is you know don't underestimate the past um they knew what they were doing so uh those are my um handy tips for writing about ancient times um and just moving on from that a couple of my favorite books about writing right uh, uh, written set in ancient times um these are both sort of young adult type books. Um, the first one is The God Beneath the Sea by um, Leon Garfield and Edward Blishen um, with wonderful, wonderful illustrations by Charles Keeping. They, 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 this made a huge impression on me when I read it as I think, I don't know, I was about 13 or something. Um, that's my, I'm glad to see that, yes, they've pretty much got the same, that's because this is my battered old copy. And uh, I know I recommended Leon Garfield last time, but he, is, he was an amazing writer. And it, this has a real sense of the gods of ancient Greece. Um, it's mostly about the gods, less about the people, but it really is, the sequel is more about the people. It's fantastic. So it can be read by any age, and I do urge you to try it. It's fantastic. And then The Myths of the Norsemen, which is Roger Lancelin Green. I think I've mentioned him before. He does wonderful, did wonderful retellings of um, the the myths of both Greece and um, all over the world. This is my battered puffin copy from when I was ten. Um, but yes, I think I, I wrote an introduction for one of one of those because it really is terrific. Now you might might think um, I haven't actually mentioned any sort of more recent books about the Stone Age or, or you know, ancient times. There may well be brilliant ones, but I can't think of any at the moment. And I don't tend to keep up that much with um, what's recently been published, unless it's relevant to my writing. Films, though, I did mention a couple of films. I actually think Gladiator is a terrific um, evocation of ancient Rome. I did actually rather fancy Russell Crowe when it came out. I've gone off him since then, but I just thought it was it was it had something, and it, 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 the recreation of ancient Rome is terrific. Yes, it's violent, um, and I don't normally like violence, but it worked because it's part of the time, and and um, it was brilliant. And yes, it took a few liberties, but um, terrific. And then another film, which oh, this is how not to, in a way recreate the stone age um but it came out i saw it it blew me away when i was five admittedly one million years bc this was produced in i think 1966 um as i say i was five it breaks all the rules i mean you've got you've got dinosaurs and people um and look at their wonderful rough fur you know i was just talking about the fur that you know it's all sort of making them look like they don't know what they're doing pterodactyls carrying away yes Rachel Welsh in the famous fur bikini <laughs> I mean and yet the nails are beautifully done even when I was five I noticed that they had the most beautifully you know manicured nails why um, and then she gets carried off by a pterodactyl strangely though it is actually quite a compelling story although I haven't seen it there you go stop motion um, pterodactyl and he's balancing yes wonderful stuff it's quite useful sometimes to see how not to do it. I think most people, if they're trying to 
write a book these days about ancient times would try to be a little bit more accurate than that. Um, giant iguanas, yeah. Moving right along, let's get more serious now. Um, that's the ancient world for you. But let's get now to some readers' questions. And of course, you're much more intelligent and better organized than I am because I've just tried to find my readers' questions, but I have found them. Here we are. Um, so let's kick off. We'll start off with something about my ghost stories. Um, lovely comment from Gordon, um, just to say how much you enjoyed Dark Matter and Thin Air. Thank you so much for that, Gordon. That really means a lot. Am I planning to write more ghost stories? Um, I would love to if I get an idea. I haven't yet. Um, if an idea comes, I'd love to. At the moment, I'm writing a gothic story, which I am thoroughly enjoying. So um, not quite ghosts, but gothic. Then we have um, something on film here. John, um, everyone's asking about The Wolf Chronicles being made into a movie. I'd love to know. Oh, yes, that this is, again, about ghost stories. If dark matter or thin air would receive the same treatment in the future. Thank you for saying that. They're superb and creepy. Um, well, I can tell you that Dark Matter is being developed for film. Uh, I've seen the script last year, and it's terrific. And I don't often say that about scripts. I've seen quite a few scripts adapting my work, and this really is terrific. I don't only say that because it sticks quite closely to the story of Dark Matter, but because actually the screenwriter, she's added some bits, which, well, there's one bit in particular, and I think, oh, I wish I'd written that. Um, so I really, you know, we're hoping that it will get underway. And if, if, if shooting starts, I will mention it on my website. Um, now we have uh, a comment about uh, Gods and Warriors from Caleb, um, who's read the whole of Gods and Warriors. I won't read the whole of the, 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 the comment. Uh, because it would take too long, but it's a um, great comment and also some great suggestions for sequels about, um, you know, perhaps the descendants of either Telamon or, or Koronos or other descendants um, returning. And that that's very much in keeping with the times, Caleb, you know, because that's what would happen. I haven't got any plans, I have to say, but to, to do a sequel to Gods and Warriors, but thanks. Um, Kariana now, um, who visited met me at Wolf at the UK Wolf Conservation Trust. Um, I'm so glad I've been an inspiration, Kariana. And uh, yeah, you were pretty good at drawing then. And she's really come on now because she's posted some pictures, which I think we could see. And, and they're beautifully observed. And um, I mean, the wolves, you know, they really are. That one of wolf, the wolf, I say wolf sleeping, just lovely, um, really gorgeous. And then there's a, yeah, a few more. Um, absolutely lovely, a little bit more fantastic wolf there. So thank you for sharing those, Kariana. Now we have something. Um, from now on, this is all Chronicles related. Um, lots of you on that. Um, Enzo here, um, you're currently reading Chronicles. I'm really glad you're enjoying it, Enzo. Now you've just finished Outcast. Um, favorite book in the series so far, yay. Um, yes, question. How come Torak's name pebble was so powerful at keeping Torak bound to the Viper Mage's will? Well, it just was. <laughs> um, it's partly because Torak himself believes it. Um, you know, in those days, he 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 believes that his name pebble has been, it, 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 you know, it has power over him and it's been taken. Um, so, you know, it just was. Some things you have to just take on trust. Another quick question. Ah, yes, this might embarrass you. And so what is a moon bleed? Well, a moon is a month in Torax time. And Ren has reached the age when every month she bleeds a bit. So it's a period, really. Um, I remember my editor didn't want me to mention that in, in the book, but I thought, no, we've got to. And traditional people do actually mark it. They need to show that the girl has turned into a woman. So um, I'm glad you asked that, actually. And so now here we have something from Edith. Um, very nice of you to say that you love my work. Uh, and thank you for that. And yes, you're asking me about for ideas for a tattoo. Um, for, you know, what ideas. I don't quite know if this is something you want to have tattooed on you. And I don't know how old you are, Edith, so I might get into trouble if I start suggesting that you get tattooed. But generally, 
ideas for tattoos yeah well um the best i can do reaching down is to show you i mean these are my old battered copies of wolf brother but on the cover i mean i know the covers are different now but this is the original wolf brother um and you can see the design of the sort of the the wolf and and the torak figure in front but the wolf is quite a nice design i've met someone who's had that tattooed and then this is my even more battered copy of um soul eater very battered because actually hang about yes you can see that it's missing a bit in its core of the corner um if i can do that yeah that's because torak when he was a, the wolf when he was a cub took a bite out of it but on the back um you can see there's there's spirals there's sort of um forest symbols you know something like that maybe um that might be an idea but again be careful about having yourself tattooed um now moving on nikki here we are uh what have we got yes oh yes now nikki wants to know um you've bought uh you'd like to buy all six books um, as a set for your daughter, which is lovely of you. Um, and yes, it is difficult now because they've been out for sort of quite a few years. Um, you haven't been able to find, just buy a set. I'm not very good at this, um, Nikki, but I, I think your best bet's probably Amazon. Um, they might be able to just provide you with a, a full set. Um, I'm sorry I can't help more on that. I feel I should be able to, but I, I can't really because I'm not really involved in that side of things. But good luck. Um, now we have about five questions all about the Chronicles. Is there going to be a Chronicles film? So we'll, we'll go quickly through them and then I'll, I'll sort of answer a little bit. Um, this is from Anna I'm uh, just wondering if a film has been made on the books. Not yet. If, if there is, you'll hear about it um, here. Um, here we have Katrine, who is Faroese. This is wonderful. Um, well, I think you're Faroese because your your books have been translated into Faroese. You've been saying, yes, I know, and it's wonderful. I've got copies, and they, they feel as if they turned into Norse sagas. Um, and your tw uh, Katrine's 12-year-old son, and she loved them. And lately he's been asking about a movie, and you've heard rumours, and you've, you say you've seen a trailer on YouTube. Well, it, it won't be for a Wolf Brother movie because there isn't a movie of Wolf Brother. So... I'm interested if you think it was for Wolf Brother, um, but no, I'm afraid not. Um, there isn't, so there isn't a movie, um, and no plans as yet for one. But if if we change, if that changes, you know, I'll let you know. Um, now, Tinu, uh, sorry, I'm yes, Tinu. Um, oh, you've been obsessed with Chronicles ever since your English class read it. Well. If English isn't your first language, you certainly speak it very well and you write it brilliantly. Uh, your question is, have you ever considered making animated movies of the books instead of a real life one? Um, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, yes, of course, I've considered it, but it's not up to me, you see, because that would cost a lot of money. Either making a film or um, animated version would cost a lot of money. And uh, it's not really up to me. But if someone came along with an interesting idea... Um, you know, I'd listen to it. Anyway, regardless, Tinu says, I'll be waiting to buy the DVD box sets and listen to the wonderful soundtracks, Trump soundtracks, because I know there will be beautiful soundtracks. Oh, yes, I'm sure there will be or would be. Now we have Martin. Um, I'm a big fan of Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. Thank you, Martin. The stories um, differed greatly from other books from young people. Good. Uh, I gained a love for nature. I'm really glad about that and felt it was very exciting and a new impression of the Stone Age. I believe the books are worth being filmed. There is once again a new film series which is based on a fantastic book. Um, your, your characters would fill the hearts of many new fans. Well, thank you for that, Martin. Um, and finally, Josh Ball. Um, nice suggestion here. You should sell the film rights to the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness to Netflix. It would be fantastic. You know, I tend to agree. That's a pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> But it's up, for, up to Netflix to ask me whether I would or not, I think. Um, now we have two questions, which I'm going to answer together because they're both about cartoons. Um, now I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name right. Is it Pern van Meurs? 
um, probably from the Netherlands. My mother will kill me for getting that wrong because she she was born in Antwerp. Anyway, um, Plön or Plön. Um, yeah, you read Tarek and Wolf, the Dutch version. Um, now you have an interest in making a comic out of this series and you want my permission to do so. Um, well, I, you know, what I would say to that is by all means go ahead and have fun with it. Uh, do what you like with it and put it on, you know, post it and, and have fun. But don't try to make money out of it. Just don't try to sell it because then you get into complicated problems with contracts and copyright and that sort of thing. So um, fan fan art is lovely and there's plenty of it it's about chronicles but just as long as you don't try to sell it that would be fine um and a long uh, and very very lovely uh post from uh kate ambrose um who's perhaps a little older and uh recently graduated congratulations with a, a degree in marketing and art um and you're asking a, a similar question. Would you, you really want to animate Chronicles of Ancient Darkness? Um, fell in love with the series when you were in middle school. That's lovely. Um, and you're sort of trying to find your path. Um, again, the same answer, really, Kate. Um, by all means, have fun with it, uh, as long as you don't sort of go down the commercial route with it, um, because, you know, that, then we do get involved in copyright and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I think just treat it as, you know, a project to have fun with. That That's my advice, um, rather than trying to, to make money out of it. But the thing that you say at the end, I mean, this interests me that, you know, it's so nice if you just say, look, if your answer is no, I kindly thank you for creating and pursuing your career. How lovely of you, Kate. The fact that you made a dr drastic career swap is very inspiring. This She's referring to the fact that I used to be a lawyer for 13 years. And, um, Kate's a business major who intends moving towards the more expressive, uh, creative route. Well, good luck with that, Kate. I really hope you follow through on that because it sounds like that's where your heart is. Um, so, you know, I don't know at what stage of life you are, you know, how the money is and all that, but the best of luck with that, Kate. Um, and now we've got a little clutch of questions, I think there's six questions, all about is there a sequel to Chronicles? Now, I did go into that in quite a lot of detail in the sort of additional um, post that I do, podcast, whatever it's called, uh, MP Live, I did a couple of weeks ago. So I'll go quickly here. Uh, Aidan um, wants to know if there'll be a seventh book um, or a second series. Yeah, not asking much, Aidan, are you? Uh, Julia, also uh, a lovely um, post, you know, loves the books. I'm worrying about when I reach the end of the series, what am I supposed to read? Um, well, I'm <laughs> sure just start again, start reading the series from scratch. Thanks also for your picture, Julia. Um, I've seen it, but as a matter of policy, we don't post pictures of um, readers on, on the website, I'm sure you understand. Uh, Ivan or Ivan, please make another Wolf Brother series. Um, Danielle, just thanking me for being the reason you got into re reading. I'm so glad, Danielle. Um, am I ever planning to write a series like this one, All Gods and Warriors, again? I'll be first in line to buy it. That's lovely of you, Danielle. I may well write another series about something, <laughs> uh, but I've got my Gothic novel to finish for now. Um, that's drawing to a close, so soon enough I'll be starting to think about something else. Yulia. I think that's how I pronounce your name, uh, is Slovenian, but you wouldn't know it from her writing. Her English is absolutely terrific. Um, and she goes into quite a lot of detail how much she absolutely loves Chronicles and the Gods and Warriors series. Has a great idea um, about a nut for a sequel, another spirit walker that they encounter. That's a brilliant idea. Um, that really is. And how would that work out? And then a PS, even more dramatic, Ren falls in love with him. Whoa, that's really interesting. Um, and then we have Deb, who also loves the Wolf Brother series. This is the last of the sequel questions. Um, could you probably do the same kind of series, but with different people? Maybe change the time a bit, but not drastically? Um, well, I think what I can say is if I, if I do, if I if ever did go back and do another 
sequel to or a sequel to Chronicles. Um, I would, I think I said it in my last podcast, I would definitely stay with the original characters, Torek and Ren and Wolf. That I can say because I just, that's where my heart is. And I think that that's where most of your hearts are. Um, but whether I will or not, I'm not sure yet. I still need to wait for, a, a, you know, I have to have a really good idea. But they haven't left me. So kind of never say never. We are coming to a close. We've got just, I think, three more questions. But they're quite good. They're quite interesting ones. The first one is from Elsa. Um, you lo I love your Chronicles book so much. And there are two questions. The first one um, I have actually cut because... Um, I will mention it, Elsa, but it's a massive spoiler if people haven't read Outcast. So I'm going to paraphrase it. So, um, th so Elsa's question being um, paraphrased by me, but not appearing on screen, was Seshru always, always planned to be who she turns out to be? Um, that's my bit that I've inserted. Or did you only factor that in when you started to write Outcast? Well, no, I'd always planned that. Those sort of revelations, so Seshru's real identity, um, what's kind of weird about Far's knife, I think you have to know that right from the word go. Um, otherwise, you get and tie yourself the most frightful knots or there will be non sequiturs somewhere, whatever. So, yeah, I always knew that. Um, so, yeah, I was, and I knew who was going to live and who was going to die and that sort of thing. So, uh, because that's how I write. Second question from Elsa, I'm always fascinated by the food in Chronicles. Are there any Stone Age recipe books you can recommend? Well, not really recipe books from the Stone Age that I know of, um, but there's a couple of, there's a wonderful book that um, I used when I was, I don't know, 11 or something called Food for Free by Richard Maybe, M-A-B-E-Y, Food for Free. And I think it's been reissued or it's still available. And that just deals with natural food that you can find in the countryside. Um, you've got to be very careful to identify it properly. <laughs> uh, never eat anything unless you know you've identified it and it can be eaten. But that's quite a good guide. Um, that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, and Elsa's third question, do you have a full list of the names of the moon somewhere? I was thinking of DIYing a Chronicles calendar. What a great idea. Uh, you know, I keep meaning to do this, but you see, I have been writing other books. I don't really have a nice, clean, tidy list because as I was writing, you know, I did have a list and then I kept amending it. And then, you know, Tarek would go to the far north and then they have different names, different clans up there have different names. So <laughs> it's um, all rather messy and mostly just in my head. At some point, I probably will get round to doing that, but I haven't done it yet. So you've, you've found me out there, Elsa. And finally, we've got two questions about Far's knife, um, which is really interesting. The first one, Liam, uh, is there a p picture of what Far's knife looked like? Well, no, there isn't an actual picture, but I can help you. You plan on recreating a knife. Um, what a great idea. Yeah. Um, this makes a certain sense to me as a nine-year-old doesn't have much of a frame of reference for a prehistoric knife. And so Torax knife became a sort of abstract idea that I could never fully realize. I was a peculiar child. No, not you weren't peculiar. You were just living in the world. Um, and then there's another question from Gracie, much shorter. Miss Paver, what does Torax father's knife look like? Well, um, let me just where did I? Oh, yes. I'm going to disappear, but I'm going to just reach down and get this, that picture that I've thrown on the floor. Just a minute. Oh, nearly doing my back in there, but you remember this? Um, there we are, even getting it up the right way. Now, this is a sort of ceremonial knife because it's all of one, one part. But the description of uh, the blade, I think, um, gives you a, a reasonable idea of the shape of Far's knife that the, of the blade. Now this is actually flint, um, so it's got sort of flaked edges. Far's knife would be a little different. Let's just get the description. Um, yeah, Far's knife was beautiful and deadly with a blade of banded blue slate shaped like a willow leaf. 
and a haft or ha handle of red deer antler that was bound with elk sinew for a better grip. So if you imagine this shape, but in blue slate. Um, now slate, that's, you don't flake it. It's a different way of shaping it. You should chip away at it. So it's quite difficult to do, you know, really quite difficult. Now for the handle, um, this is not, a, a, you know, this is just a sort of um, small knife made out of, actually made out of antler by the Sami people up in Northern Lapland. But if you can see, I don't know if you can see the, the handle, it's bound, this is bound in pine root, um, split pine root. So it's very tightly bound. And so it's the same idea with the elk sinew, the, the sinew. It would be bound on while it's wet. And then as it dries, it shrinks and it gets really tight. And that gives you a really nice grip. So if your hands are slippery, it gives you a nice grip. Um, and of course, it also covers up things that may be hidden in the handle, as we know, if we've read the whole of Chronicles. So I hope that gives you some idea um, and good luck with the reproduction. Now, I've gone on a bit longer than I said I would. I said it was going to be 20 minutes, um, but it's a lot longer than that. Sorry about that. But you've all asked so many brilliant questions. Uh, we've reached the end now, so that's all we've got time for. Um, if I haven't answered any your questions yet, I will uh, in the next Michelle Paver Live. Keep them coming, please. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's mm -hmm. just go to the best way to, to be sure that I'll, I'll read them and then answer them is to go to michellepaver.com slash ask. Um, don't forget to enter the Thin Air Prank Video Competition, if at all possible. Um, and next month, I will be tackling writing about the natural world, as well as more of your questions. So many thanks for tuning in or whatever <laughs> you say, and I'll talk to you next month. Bye.